So um, anyway, it's great to be here. I always love stopping by here. The, it's beautiful in Reading, and actually the, I like the country, the countryside there quite a bit, but it, I, bad thing about leaving Loma Linda is a family here and good friends and everything, so we, we always enjoy coming back. Uh, this particular topic today, I've uh, been thinking, oh, hey. I've been, uh, just reminds me, uh, Wes uh, Kime and me have been uh, talking uh, uh, to this gentleman for quite some time, over a year, about, uh, he's agnostic, and his big hang up with not just accepting Christianity or the, or the clear existence of God is that science doesn't talk about God. You can't address the existence of God with rational thought or science. It's just based on faith, or more like a blind faith. And so I was thinking about that. I was like, that'd be unusual if God actually does exist. Uh, and he made our brains, and like Galileo said, why would he make our brains and then expect us not to use them to identify uh, things he, he reveals to us about himself? And it's like, that, that's kind of an odd thing, but how do I explain it? And so I started thinking about this. And um, so this is just uh, my thoughts on this idea of um, how do you know when a miracle happens? And uh, can you actually detect God's signature in nature or in anything, uh, the Bible, um, rationally? or scientifically. So first of all, what is science? Um, it's pretty basic. Uh, there's all kinds of rules and definitions you'll hear, but basically, you use the past to predict the future. And uh, you have to have this certain features about predicting the future where you have to predict the future in a testable, potentially falsifiable manner. And if your prediction fails, you have to revise something or re start over. Well, it basically means you have to propose something that can be disproven, theoretically at least. You have to be able to test it so that you can be wrong, uh, definitively wrong. Like if I, if I uh, scratch my nose and roll double sixes, dice, so I'll say, well, maybe scratching my nose caused me to roll the double sixes. So in the future, I predict I will roll double sixes again every time I scratch my nose. That's potentially falsifiable because if I don't roll double sixes in the future after I scratch my nose when something's wrong with my hypothesis. So, But if, if it's true and you can't prove it false, what is that? If it's true you and you can't prove it false, it's not science. Well, maybe I can put it a different way. <laughs> if, you, if you can't falsify something, it also means that it is totally useless. Because whatever happens is within your range of prediction. And so if you want predictive ability, you have to have falsifiability. They're two sides of the same coin. Right. I mean, anyway, we can talk about this more at the end, but uh, because I have 80 slides. <laughs> so, Excuse yeah, me. Uh, beyond this, uh, to me, it seems especially relevant to this topic is that Science is not limited in its ability to detect the existence of the miraculous, only in its ability to explain the miraculous. And as an example, it's kind of like women, <laughs> at least for us men anyway. We know that they exist and we know that they're miraculous, but sometimes they're explaining how it all works is a little bit uh, fuzzy. Right? So there's this famous cartoon, he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. But this is not really how science works. Oftentimes, science proposes ideas and hypotheses that nobody knows why they work. They just know, we just know that they work. Like, for example, um, Newton, when he's proposing his theory of gravity and he sees the apple fall and the cannonball fly at certain predictable patterns, he has no idea what makes gravity work. He just knows that it works. And it's essentially a miracle as far as he knows, but it has predictive value. And so uh, can we use this to identify uh, the divine hand or other forms of miracle? Well, then comes along after Newton, of course. Newton attributed pretty much everything to God. Uh, but then comes along methodological and philosophical naturalism and people who propose that, these philosophical ideas. For example, Pierre Simon de Laplace, he was talking to Napoleon. And Napoleon had read some of his works and said, hey, I, 
I never see that you mention God when you're talking about the solar system or your mathematical theories of nature and all this. And, and uh, Pierre basically said, well, I, I had no need of that hypothesis. And uh, so I was like, well, is there a point where you ever do have a need? And a lot of people say, well, when you're doing science, no. Uh, J.B.S. Haldane basically said, my practice as a science, scientist is atheistic. That is, when I set up an experiment, I assume that no god or angel or devil is going to interfere with its course. And this assumption has been justified by such success as I have achieved in my professional career. I should therefore be intellectually dishonest if I were not also atheistic in the affairs of the world. And uh, he's not alone, of course. This is a very popular idea. Uh, William Provine. Professor of Biological Sciences at Cornell, late professor. He says, uh, this basically, this idea, it, it was existed for a long time, but it started with Darwin to become really popular and mainstream. He said, evolution is the greatest engine of atheism ever invented. Naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Charles Darwin understood perfectly. And he lists some of these off. He says, no God's worth having exist. Even if there is a God, he's not worth having. Uh, no life after death exists. Ultimate foundation for ethics does not exist. No ultimate meaning in life exists, and human free will is non-existent. Non he says, in other words, religion is compatible with modern evolutionary biology and indeed all of modern science if religion is effectively indistinguishable from, a from atheism, which kind of gets us back to that whole falsifiability. And I, personally, I would have to agree with uh, William here, uh, William Praveen if you take on the perspective of uh, naturalistic evolution or naturalism in general, methodological or philosophical naturalism. Uh, Einstein also, um, pretty, if he wasn't an atheist, he was really, really close to it. He said, in response to a little girl who wrote him a letter and asked him, if scientists pray, this is what he said. He said, Science, scientific research is based on the idea that everything takes place is determined by the laws of nature. For this reason, a research scientist will hardly be inclined to believe that events could be influenced by a prayer, i.e. by a wish addressed to a supernatural being. So what do we do with this? Arthur Strahler uh, basically said the same thing. If science must include a supernatural realm, it would be forced into a game where there are no rules. Without rules, there's no scientific observation, explanation, or prediction that can enjoy a high probability of being the correct picture of the real world. You have to have rules to have science. And if you don't have rules because supernatural being can do whatever he wants, how can you possibly have science and rational thought? So what does the Bible say? As comparison, this is just for argument's sake, right? Just proposing two different options here. The Bible basically says you're an idiot if you, if you don't accept the existence of God. In Psalms, David says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So uh, there you go. And uh, he goes on to say that uh, if you look at the stars, you can detect God's handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, or even though they don't actually have ver words, you know, no speech, and they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet a voice, their voice goes out through all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. And um, in Romans, Paul also says this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from the things that have been made so that people are without excuse. Randy Roberts talked about this particular verse in his sermon today. If you haven't heard it, he talks about this. And it... And then Peter basically claims it's a sign of the end when you start not recognizing God's signature in nature. He says, above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on it as it has been since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word and the heavens came into being and the water was formed <coughs> and the water, and was formed out of water and by water. So these are two claims. Well, who's right? You know, you can make, it's easy to make claims, but where's the evidence? Lie, is it with the philosophical naturalists or the Bible? And you know me, I like to talk about the turtles all the way down. Um, you know, I don't know. I can't explain the first turtle or the last one, right? 
Uh, I can't explain something coming from nothing or somebody speaking something into existence or anything like that. But neither can naturalists either. They can't explain where the Big Bang come from or how something could come from nothing either, even though they try very hard to do that. But I would propose to you that you can tell which way the turtles are going. Are they going up or are they going down? And uh, <clears throat> so given that basic idea, here's a little quiz I have for you. These are crystals, snowflakes, salt crystals, pyrite crystals. Can these be produced by natural, known natural mechanisms? Yes or no? Yes? Yes, right? All right, they can all be produced naturally by no natural mechanism. How about these? River rocks? How many would say these were produced by natural mechanisms? Raise your hand. Yeah, well, you are all wrong because these are fake rocks <laughs> made to look like natural rocks. So, it's the, you know, you can make things look natural by intelligent design, right? But it's harder to go the other way around. So it kind of speaks to this idea of which way are the turtles are going. These are granite cubes used by industry for precise measurements. Um, let's say a Mars rover came across one of these measuring a meter in uh, measurements on each side. You don't think that would hit the front page of every newspaper in the world saying, you know, Martians have been discovered or evidence of Martians have been discovered? How about this? Natural or design? Well, it's clearly designed because it says planting a natural garden. Right, so it's the same thing of those rocks. How about this? Definitely design, right? You don't believe the seeds just fell like that and they grew like that all by themselves? No, because you can kind of see certain patterns that are designed or not, that are clearly designed or not necessarily designed. How about this? Now, it's possible I could have set up the driftwood like that to look like it just got washed ashore, but you're not gonna, you know, you don't doubt me if I say, well, I just came across this and this, this happened on this beach one day. Right? You don't, no one would doubt that, but if, if I tried to tell you the same story for this, you'd say you're nuts, right? Same for this, I just like these beechwood horses. And this, uh, you know, it kinda, this definitely looks natural for most people, but what about that? <laughs> or that? You know, I was walking down the creek one day and you know, the, the latest flood just washed them all into place like that. It's like you're an idiot, right? Or that. <laughs> you know, there's an earthquake and the rocks just fell like that. Or uh, you find a bunch of sandstone uh, blocks that happen to arrange themselves like that. No one believes that. Why not? There's these levels of complexity and levels of design. And I call them all miracles, but they're miracles on different levels. Uh, they're miracles depending on your perspective. Let's put it that way. Here's the first family portrait by my boy Wesley when he was about one and a half. And uh, I'm the one with the big head. <laughs> so, but at least you can tell it's designed, right? No one questions just because it's on a lower level, you can't tell it's designed. So a family portrait by my second boy, Bradley, another, they're growing up and getting more, more uh, precise here, right? At least we're holding hands. And uh, you can start to get more detail, right? And you, you evolve, if you want to use that word. Uh, more higher, higher levels of design, you can tell which way the turtles are going. This is Wesley's blue dog from his first grade. And this is Picasso's dog. I like Wesley's dog better, personally. <laughs> now we just move up some levels, you know, from a perspective. This, is this miraculous from Wesley's perspective or even my perspective? <laughs> it's like, yes, it's starting to get more and more miraculous here, uh, at least on a higher level. And you can tell, well, no one would say, not even Dawkins uh, would say that this just happened by lightning, multiple lightning strikes over millions of years in the Sahara Desert or something. No one would argue that. Uh, when you have multiple interacting parts working together to produce a common goal or function, no one argues, at least on mechanical devices, that these things aren't designed. Everybody recognizes this design ever since Pele brought up the argument, and no one has presented an effective argument against this, except when it comes to biology. Yeah. Now this is interesting, because this is the same kind of gears, but a higher power view of these gears, but they happen to belong to a hopping insect called the Isis. And uh, they're the first gears found in nature uh, in a living thing. And here they are working and it helps the thing hop in a straight direction while it's maturing because the nerves just don't operate fast enough for the legs to stay together properly and hop 
collectively in a, in a common direction. So it makes these, has these gears. And then when it molts, it eventually gets rid of them and opts for some other system. Uh, here's also a nut and bolt in the knees of weevils and beetles. And you can see that the, it kind of screws in, the nut screws into the bolt. There, this is also a surprise that was found recently, uh, 2011. This was discovered and how they, these parts uh, have to fit properly in order to have a common function, a collective function. Higher power view of this. And uh, this is interesting too. You know, you, this <coughs> life, at least complex life on this planet, would be impossible without fungus. This particular fungus, the pilobolus, uh, happens to grow on cow manure. And, uh, but it's fascinating fungus because uh, <coughs> to distribute its spores, it launches them at the highest uh, gravitational force uh, of any living thing uh, in nature. And it accelerates that little cannonball at the tip. Uh, it sends it off about two meters away from itself and it accelerates about one million times its own length uh, in about one second or with 20,000 to 180,000 times the force of gravity, uh, g's. And equivalency, if you used a rifle bullet and you fired a rifle bullet at the same speed, it would be traveling 54,000 miles an hour. Uh, so it's an extreme uh, rate of acceleration. And this is kind of some pictures of it going. Here's a little video of it. And it just goes, also it has to be properly oriented. That little cannonball has to be properly placed to shoot in the right direction. The fluid has to explode in a precise manner right behind the cannonball to shoot it off in a proper way. All these multiple parts working together at the same time. Also, it's light sensitive, so it can aim itself based on the direction the sun is located. Uh, it's just an amazing little device. Um, and uh, it's not going to work unless you have things set up properly to begin with. Anybody know what this is? This was discovered a, a couple of years ago, and nobody knew what it was at first, and they took it to the lab, and then a little spider hatched out of there in the middle. And around it is a fence that has barbed wire on multiple levels to keep out uh, ants and other insects that might disturb the egg. Right? And uh, if you don't have enough barbed wire up there to begin with and those posts set up properly, well, it's not going to work. You have to have it done precisely right at the beginning in order for it to be effective, even a little bit effective. Um, also, if you're, we're, again, we're talking about this idea of turtles all the way down. No one would say that this is uh, high-level design, but every, no one would doubt that it's still design. Again, but you move up another level to something more miraculous. And now, because this is so much more miraculous, all of a sudden I can't tell it's designed anymore, right? Well, no one says that, not even Dawkins. And this, for me, I can't make one of these. Even give me a thousand years, I'm not going to make one of these things. For me, it's miraculous from my perspective. And let's say you're just like, well, let's make it even higher level. Let's say you find a spaceship on some alien planet with one of our rovers or whatever. It happens to do something amazing beyond, way beyond human technology like travel back in time or something like that. Well, you'd still be able to tell it was designed. You'd just say, well, it's superhuman intelligence or at least technology that made this. And so you're, you're moving up levels of design, but you're still able to tell design when it's going on. So now what about godlike creative power? Is there a way to say, well, this, this seems to be like godlike creative power? And I think after a certain point, you get such high level design or requirements for design that even if it's not God that made it, like some super smart alien or whatever, you can't tell the difference. If that being came and told you, well, I am God, you would say, OK, well, yeah, you would fit all the criteria I have for God. So here's a few criteria for me, at least, where it says, after this particular point, I can't tell the difference. It might as well be God. Uh, back in 1974, Brandon Carter, Cambridge University, he proposed that there were at least 38 pre precisely fine-tuned features of the universe that were required for life to exist in the universe. By the 2001 rolled around, there's 150 of these things, the finely tuned features of the universe. And by now, there's more like, a little over 200 of these things proposed necessary for complex life to exist. And there are things like the precise speed of expansion of the universe. Everything is flying away from each other, accelerating at a certain rate to counteract gravity. 
and uh, it's called the cosmological constant. And that constant has to be extremely precise, otherwise gravity would overtake the universe and everything would crunch down together, or things would spread out too fast and stars wouldn't form and complex life couldn't exist. So the cosmological constant has to be extremely precise, tuned to one part and 10 to the 123. Now, that's like going to the Sahara Desert and finding a grain of sand, marking it with an X, mixing it all around five times in a row and finding the same grain of sand blindfolded five times in a row by random chance. Now, it's hard to believe that that happened by random chance, just that one feature of the universe. There's other features like atomic charges have to be perfectly balanced for molecules to exist. The uh, masses of protons for electrons, they also have to be perfectly balanced for complex mol molecules to exist. So how is this explained? These perfectly balanced features, hundreds of them, for the universe for complex life to exist. How do naturalistic scientists explain this or, or attempt to explain this? Well, here's Lawrence Krauss, and he wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing, in which he basically says, because of quantum theory, universes can pop in and out of existence from nothing. And he, does, he doesn't really mean nothing. He means there's this quantum lake and out of the background of the quantum lake, which he doesn't explain the origin of, he just assumes that it's eternal existence, and that because of quantum theory, things can pop in and out of existence from this lake. And effectively, there's been essentially an uh, infinite number of universes that have popped in into existence, and ours just happened to turn out right by random chance. Because if you take, you know, infinite can explain anything, right? If you have infinite number of universes, ours is bound to happen again, occasionally, right? And this is an interesting argument because it basically undermines science itself. If anything can happen by random chance with an infinite number of universes, you might as well not need science because you have no predictive value. And during an interview along these lines, he was asked a series of interesting questions. This guy Brierly, he says, do you see any evidence of purpose in the universe? And Krauss responded, well, Maybe I would if the stars lined up and spelled out a message from God, like, you know, hey, Lawrence, this is God. I'm just saying hi, checking in, right? And all the stars spelled that out. Maybe I would believe then. And uh, Briarly said, actually, no. That wouldn't be evidence for God from your multi-universe perspective, because if there's an infinite number of universes existing for an infinite amount of time, then anything can happen no matter how unlikely it is. Therefore, no evidence could convince you that God exists since the unobservable, untestable, eternal multi-universe can make anything it wants. And so you're like, huh, I'm thinking in this interview, how is he going to respond to that? And, it, and sometimes people get, get caught off guard and they say things honestly. And this is one of those times. It's very interesting. I mean, you can, two-headed cows, ten-headed cows, Arnold Schwarzenegger winning the lottery ten times in a row, nothing is going to be surprising from this perspective. So how is he going to answer this, right? So he says, that's a true statement. As soon as he said that, I was like, he's done for, right? That's a true statement is what he started out saying. He says, you talk about this God of love and everything else, but somehow, if you don't believe in him, you don't get any of the benefits. So you have to believe. And then if you do anything wrong, you're going to be judged for it. I don't want to be judged by God. And that's the bottom line, right? So does it boil down to philosophy? or religion, or science. Is it really about the evidence for Krauss? It's not really about the evidence because he's willing to toss out everything out the window in order to avoid being judged. He's willing to toss out science itself out of the window in order to avoid being judged by God on a moral basis. So it's really not about science. In fact, according to the Bible, the Bible basically said, even if you see someone resurrected from the dead, if you don't want to believe, you're not going to. Right? It doesn't really matter f as far as evidence. What matters is that you want, uh, um, it, it <laughs> what really matters is if you want to know the truth, if, you ha if you're seeking for after God and you're seeking after the truth. There's other things uh, that are interesting about this universe that are very difficult to explain. There's this uh, uh, ant matter and antimatter. And according to quantum theory, at the beginning of the universe, they should be present in equal amounts, which would mean what happens when a particle of matter hits a particle of antimatter? Oof, it turns into pure energy, right? So this would mean that we shouldn't be here at all, because if equal amounts of matter and antimatter are here, 
and, there, and there's no way to detect the difference between antimatter and matter, and matter because they're precisely the same except in opposite charges. And so you're like, well, how, how in the world can we be here? And this is an interesting question asked by CERN scientists. And here's a statement um, from Jeffrey Hoxt, a researcher at the uh, CERN Institute in Europe. He says, the Alpha team was able to see whether when researchers shone a laser on a particular frequency, the antihydrogen atoms would act like their hydrogen counterparts. The group says that they do act exactly the same. The energy transition and the collision uh, is, uh, ex is precise to two parts in 10 billion. Um, they reported on December 19, December 2017 in Nature. Uh, so just recently, right? Huh? 16, I'm sorry, 16, I've got to correct that. So, yeah, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to say the 16. Uh, accurate because uh, now they're doing the pre. Yes, it's a prelim. It's a prelim paper that's actually going to be published on the 17th, but it just recently came out this month. So, it, yeah. So it's it hasn't actually hit Nature yet, but this is a this is the statement on the article. So, so then what's his conclusion? He says we shouldn't be here. There should be no. There should be just energy. There there should be some light. And no one can explain to you why there's matter and not antimatter. Why everything just made out of matter if the universe wasn't just precisely set up to be this way uh, outside of random chance. Because there's no rational otherwise explanation for this. And some people talk about the universe as a free lunch. You know, everything adds up to zero. Except they don't explain the precision of the setup of the universe, the original setup, the original state of entropy of the universe where everything had to be in its precise spot. And um, in order to be at our current entropic state in the universe where we have energy we, uh, to use, to u do useful work at our current state in time, the Big Bang, uh, or the beginning of the universe, however you want to describe it, had to be precise <coughs> in one part in 10 to the power of 1 E123. In other words, that's 1 followed by 1 E20, or, one, or 10 to the 123 zeros. There's 10 to the 80th atoms in the visible universe. If you wrote down this number, 1 in 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you'd have to put 10 to the 40 zeros on every atom to write down this number. That's extreme precision. And no one can explain how the universe started out in such an extremely precise manner in order for us to be here now. And uh, Penrose basically said, that uh, no one can explain this problem, not even inflation can explain it. It's an extreme fine-tuning problem. And we'll talk more about Penrose later. But to illustrate this problem, here's a little video, video, funny video clip for you. So that a tornado comes flying along, everybody's scared to death, runs away from the house. The house gets ripped to shreds, right? And <laughs> put that together. <laughs> so, and then the, <laughs> the little towel comes into place, right? Notice the precision. That, that precision is actually very good compared to the precision of the ordering of the, of the universe. In other words, if every tornado that ever existed on this planet built houses like that instead of tearing them up, that would be easier to explain than the origin of the universe in such a precise manner. So, and Einstein kind of recognized this as well. He says, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that, is that it is comprehensible. You know, in other words, the universe didn't have to be built like this. It could be complete chaos, and that would be more likely than the, than the way the universe is set up so that we can actually comprehend it. This mathematically precise, it's written in the language of mathematics, and we can understand it because we can understand mathematics. And that, to, to Einstein, was, was blowing his mind. And so I was, I was kind of thinking, well, why can't you just come up with the, the idea then that if you just seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart? It's a heart problem. It's a desire problem rather than an evidence problem, as far as I see it. And, and of course, I'm not the only one. There, there's other people who recognize this who are well-known and, and scientists, uh, Nobel Prize winners. There was uh, Arno Penzias, Nobel Prize laureate. 
He says, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to provide exactly the conditions required to support life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, and that's an understatement, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, a supernatural plan. So now if you're looking which way the turtles are going, you kind of get to a level where it's looking, looking pretty supernatural here at this point. Uh, Arno Penzias, we're getting back to him again. You know, he's the one who said the fine-tuned beginning of the entropy of the universe had to be extremely fine-tuned. He said the extreme high level of fine-tuning astronomers and physicists discern powerfully suggests a purpose behind the universe. And so he, he doesn't mince words about it. And he, know, you know, he seems to uh, be pretty high level in his career. But as far, from my perspective anyway, as complex as the universe and as precise as the universe needed to be to support life, uh, life itself is more finely tuned than the entire universe, even the simplest living thing is more finely tuned, mathematically speaking, than the entire universe. Uh, it's based on an amazing system of, of like computer code, uh, DNA, four letters, four characters instead of two. I mean, David said that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but he really had no idea. We are really fearfully and wonderfully made. It's amazing because as a baby is made, for example, it's like a giant origami project. It makes a flat sheet of cells, and those sheets of cells are folded, and then that's folded and folded and folded and folded and folded, folded, and out comes a baby if everything goes right, right? That's a miracle, if anything is, especially based on how you engineer something like that with a, with a computer code. And of course, Dawkins says, well, it's no problem. Yeah, you got this massive amount of complexity and huge precision staring you in the face as a giant mountain, and how are you going to get to the top of that? He says, not a problem. You just walk around the back of the mountain, and it's nice, smooth slope to the top. And all you do is take one little step after another, and you get to the top, slowly, gradually, stepwise. What Dawkins doesn't realize, and what a lot of evolutionary biologists just don't realize, because they're just not mathematicians. And mathematicians don't realize it because they're not biologists. What they need to do is get together. What really happens here is that when you go to the back of Mountain Improbable, and you start taking the steps up the step, each step that you take in evolutionary progress can take a few steps. But the problem is each next step is exponentially higher than the one that came before, mathematically. And so it takes exponentially longer and longer periods of time for you to make any progress until by the time you're at a reasonable size protein system, so it's like it takes a thousand specifically arranged amino acids, uh, you are at the point where trillions of years aren't going to get you there. You're just not going to find anything at that level. And I can go into the details on the math. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road, really. But I don't have time to go in details right now. I'm just giving you a, an overview. Also, the mutation rate is really problematic for the naturalistic perspective because mutations are bad, by and large, to 1,000 to 1, bad versus good. And so uh, especially with the new genome project, and, and there's some debate on this, but it used to be thought that only like 2 or 3% of the human genome was functional because everybody thought only proteins, only the part of the genome that made proteins was functional. Well, now it's known that the non-coding portion of the genome, a lot of that is also functional too. Some people argue as much or over 50%, depending on who you talk to, but it's certainly a lot more than it was before. And so if you start arguing on these lines, it used to be thought that there were three detrimental mutations. Well, there's 100 mutations on average per person per generation. And of those, it was thought that three of them about were functional. And given three of those functional mutations, those are detrimental, by and large, almost always. And how are you going to overcome that? Well, the death rate would have to be extremely high. The average woman for three, and this is being conservative before the new information came along on the functionality of the genome, the average woman would have to give birth to over 20 offspring for two of them to survive without detrimental mutation load. How many women ever give birth to 20 offspring? Right? You're not doing your job. Right? Now, now, if it's more like 50 that, that you're having, right? then, then you're getting up into the, to the thousands, even millions of offspring to keep up with the detrimental mutation rate. And you're like, there's just no way. We're headed downhill. All slowly reproducing creatures are statistically headed downhill. The turtles are going downhill, not uphill. And to, at such a fast rate, those turtles are clipping along that uh, Nothing, human, all mammals, for example, would be extinct within less than a million years from the beginning at this rate. Uh, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't go along with uh, naturalistic uh, proposals. And uh, there's no naturalistic explanation to make natural selection work better to do this. You can put it off for a little bit, but eventually the detrimental mutation rates are going to catch up and wipe you out. 
uh, send you to eventual genetic meltdown and extinction. Here's a, uh, some molecular machines. How do you tell these machines apart from natural ones? These particular ones are designed by uh, students uh, um, who propose these machines and build them, molecular machines, on a micro scale. And you're like, well, what's the difference between these ones and these ones, right? These machines are much more complicated. This machine is ATP synthase. It's got these little rotors and everything in it. Extremely complicated machine that makes the energy currency of your cells. And you're like, well, how do you know that this one is not designed and the other one is, just because it's in a living thing? And uh, you just don't understand the mechanism, the evolutionary mechanism and how to do this. Here's a machine that has two little feet and walks along inside all of your cells, pulling cargo around from one place to the other. Without these machines, you wouldn't live. No complex organism would exist without all these little machines. And you have to have all the parts there at the same time working in a precise order and to create useful collective functionality to do something like this. Uh, here's another machine where during mitosis inside the cell, all the chromosomes line up in the middle. You know, they got these uh, tubules that come in and attach to them at specific places. And how do you know when, when it's the right time? Because if you pull them apart at the right, wrong time, you only get, uh, you're gonna get messed up. So when it's the right time, these little robots go along down the tubules, uh, information signals to say everything's set up properly, it's time to divide, right? Without these robots carrying their signals at just the right time, all set up properly, and you're missing your robots, you're not gonna divide your chromosomes, you're not gonna survive, you're gonna die. And if you don't have that set up at the beginning, all right, it's just not gonna work. Uh, here's another interesting machine that copies your DNA. The, the, the blue thing in the front that's spinning around, it's spinning at the speed of a jet engine. And it's got these little arms that reach and gr they grab the strands of the DNA to copy them. And without all these parts, there are dozens of parts here, uh, you just, you're gonna die. <laughs> and it will have to be set up properly right at the beginning, you're just not gonna exist. How is that explained? The same thing with uh, copying the DNA into useful, useful code called message RNA. That's a very complicated process, and it's based on a code. You've got a molecule that attaches uh, to one amino acid, and it has a three-letter code, and it comes up and matches the messenger or the um, DNA sequence at that three-letter spot. And when the code matches, the key matches, then it attaches its little amino acid to the growing protein chain. And all those parts have to, have to be there at the same time for that to happen, extremely complex. And that happens in the simplest living thing. You, you're just not going to be exp able to explain this chicken or the egg paradox by natural mechanisms. It's just irrational at that point because it's more complicated to explain such a machine than it is to explain the origin of the universe. By that way, that's at real time. It happens really fast. <laughs> flying through. Here's the little molecules coming together, lining up with the DNA. If you study this in any detail, you're going to be overwhelmed by this. It, it, it takes weeks and weeks to understand this. And here's, here they are clipping together in real time, forming the protein chains. These little carrier molecules carrying the, the they're like locks and keys, and they, they match the little coded sequence as it comes through like a tape. And it's just really complicated. Uh, same thing with the bacterial flagellum. Bacterial flagellum looks like an outboard motor. It has a drive shaft. It has a clutch. It, it can spin up to 100,000 cycles per minute in one direction and then stop in a quarter turn and reverse and go the other direction so that the bacterium can swim in different directions uphill toward the source of food, right? If you can't switch the direction of your flagellar motor, it's pointless to have one. You have to be able to turn it backwards and forwards. And you also have to make it uh, at extreme speed. Let's say you only had an, a, a motor that spun at 10 cycles a minute. Well, that motor is not going to help you because there's this problem called Brownian motion. At that tiny scale, the molecules bounce against the bacteria and then flip it all in different directions all the time. And if you only have a slowly spinning motor, it's not going to overcome the effect of Brownian motion and give you any survival advantage. And so you have to have a very uh, strong motor right at the beginning in order to give you an advantage. And this motor has to have 40 structural parts at minimum. Some people argue for uh, you know, maybe up to 21, but a whole bunch of, of structural parts, not to mention the chaperone proteins that help build this thing. 
which is extremely complicated in itself. And these things just are not explainable. There's not a single step of a, such a machine that has been demonstrated much explained in, in scientific literature. There's also other structures that are kind of look magnificent. Like <coughs> here's, here's a, uh, a sea creature, a tiny little microscopic organism compared to uh, what we all know as <laughs> the Roman Colosseum. They look kind of similar. Uh, beautiful things and, and all these structures are, are precise and math mathematical. How does that happen? There's a lot of comparison where we say, well, that's design and the other one's not. Based on what? Certainly not mathematical or statistical analysis. Here's the uh, status cilia inside your ear that help you hear. They're lined up like a choir with the short ones in front and the tall ones in the back. And uh, as they bend, when the fluid pushes against them, when they're vibrated on your eardrum, they they can bend by uh, the size of a diameter of an atom. And when they bend by just a tiny amount like that, they have this little rope on their heads. The head of one choir member goes to, a rope goes to the head of another choir member. And as they bend back, the rope pulls open um, little uh, ion gates that lets the ions flow through and sends a signal to the nerve and lets you hear. Right, without all these parts being there, and there's like dozens of these parts that all have to be there precisely for you to hear. Uh, how did that rope get there and how to get the proper length and how did this, this arrangement get set up? Slowly, you have to have numerous parts for this thing to work. All there at the, at the beginning uh, to make it work. Here's that little rope going from one head to the other attached to the gate, to the ion gate. So is there anybody who ex understands this and who's talking about this besides us or people who are creationists? James Tour, he's a, probably the, in the top 10 synthetic biochemists in the world. And this is what he says about this problem. He says, let me tell you what goes on in the back rooms of science with Natural Academy members, Nobel Prize winners. I've sat with them. And when I get them alone, not in public, because it's a scary thing if you said what I just said, and what he said is basically this is design. He said, I, I say to these people, do you understand all of this, where all this came from, and how this happens from a naturalistic perspective? And just to give you an idea what he does, like right now he's making these little tiny cars. They're doing a tour of the France, these molecular cars. And they're doing the tour on a, an, a square centimeter of gold. And in comparison, that square centimeter of gold for the size that we're talking about would be equivalent to about two thirds around the world, the distance that these cars would have to travel. And so they, there are all kinds of different cars and they're racing them to see which one goes better. Which, and this is kind of an illustration of what they're doing. Kind of cool things he does, uh, making these tiny little things. And it has medical implications as well, uh, practical, not just racing cars, but eventually they're going to get to some uh, cool practical stuff. But uh, this is what he says about synthesizing these things. This is hard stuff to do. You can't just randomly synthesize these things. He says, every time I sat with these people who are synthetic chemists who understand this, they go, uh-uh, nope. These people are just so far off on how they believe this stuff just came together. I've sat with Nobel Prize winners, with Academy, National Academy members. Sometimes I will say, do you understand this? And if they're afraid to say yes, they say nothing. They just stare at me because they can't sincerely do it. So the people at the highest level who know what they're doing when it comes to making micro stuff like this, they say, this stuff just doesn't come together because it's so difficult for even to make it with intelligent design. Uh, the statistics are so, so far out, out there. There's also a few miracles of evidence, uh, evidence of miracles in geology. Um, I think you guys have talked about this already, but recently um, it's been published human footprints found, found in Crete that are older than any kind of hominid fossil in Africa, which throws the whole idea of human evolution out of Africa on its head. Because if you have nine million year old uh, human footprints that are perfectly human with five toes facing forward, a bald, an arched foot with a heel ball and everything. That kind of messes things up for human evolution in Africa. I'm not talking, don't want to get into the, to the dating right here, but according to mainstream thinking, if you use the same mechanisms and you come up with, with a much older footprint, human footprint, that kind of mess, messes up the whole reliability of your story. There's also, uh, um, the idea that uh, having a creationist perspective, a biblical perspective, makes you a better scientist. And uh, one illustration of this, I use this because Ariel happens to be here. 
it was long thought that there was these giant termite nests in the middle of flood formations, what we would call flood for formations. And so you're like, how in the world can you have termites making giant nests in the middle of a Noah's flood? You know, like that doesn't make any sense at all. But for a long time, these were thought to be termite nests. And so people would cite these all the time to me as well, saying, you guys are crazy because these, these termite nests are completely wrong. Can't possibly be flood sediments. So then Ariel comes along and he says, well, maybe they're not termite nests for real. And so he, he works on them and he, he figures out that they're inorganic crystalline deposits. They're not made by termites at all. You can talk to him more after the class about this, but that, that was discovered because he had a doubt based on the Bible, that the mainstream story was probably not true. There's also interesting fish, these silicant fish. They died out of the fossil wet record like 40 million years ago, and, um, but then they were found alive swimming off Madagascar and now several other places around the globe, alive and well, swimming around. And so they're called Lazarus taxa. They somehow came back to life. And you're like, well, it's much more consistent with a catast catastrophic story where a bunch of fish were fossilized, but a few survived and happened to, to remain our, in our modern oceans. And it's not so consistent that something like that could remain outside of the fossil record if it does really represent tens and hundreds of millions of years of time. There's also footprints in the Navajo sandstone, Coconino sandstone. The Coconino is the third sandstone layer in the Grand Canyon from the top. Um, and in these sandstone layers, there's these footprints of, of lizards and salamanders and, and arthropods. And what's interesting about these footprints, besides that they're so crisp and clear in detail, is that they're almost always going uphill. And you're like, uh, just yesterday, I got a letter from someone who wrote an article about this published in the Avenus Today saying just about me talking about this and Leonard Brand's articles on this, saying that I'm all wet, that this is crazy, uh, that uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why the Navajo and the Coconino are desert dunes over millions of years of time. And, um, but then toward the end of his article, after citing various reasons why they possibly uh, could be only going uphill or primarily going uphill. He's, he's like, well, you know, the, they could have been, uh, when they're going downhill, the sand could have rolled over and covered them up, or they could have gone to the top of the dune, walked all the way around and come back up, you know, uh, and a bunch of different things, but no one believes those things. I, I mean, you go to the desert dune today, Death Valley or whatever, and you see these trackways going uphill, downhill, downhill all over the place, and they don't favor the uphill uh, significantly. Uh, like they do in the Kakanu and the Navajo, and you're like, well, why would they be going uphill primarily? And they're also sometimes going uphill where the feet are facing in a different direction than the body is moving, like they're kind of being pushed along, sort of sideways. And so it's, it's more consistent um, that these animals are fleeing or uh, going away from something, consistently going away. Also, if you look at dinosaur eggs, around the world, all over the place, consistently, everywhere you find them, uh, they show signs of trauma or uh, stress, the, at least uh, for the mother dinosaurs. This particular nest is the, the mother dinosaur laid the nest as, as flood sediments were laying down mud at different layers. So these eggs are laid at different layers as she's laying around the circle. The, the eggs go higher and higher and higher as the flood is coming in. And as you go and look at these eggs, uh, a lot of them have two or three layers of shell, which in chickens means that the chicken was stressed and tried to retain the egg. And as it retained it to find favorable, more favorable conditions to lay the egg, it added more and more shell layers to the egg, which is a sign of stress. And how do you explain universal signs of stress all around the globe over millions of years? That doesn't make any sense. It's much more consistent with a catastrophic model of of origins of the fossil record. Same thing with dinosaur bones. Inside dinosaur bones, of course you know, uh, if you've been watching or paying attention to this topic at all, that uh, Mary Schweitzer accidentally dissolved a dinosaur bone and found that their soft tissue remains inside the dinosaur bone. Not just soft tissue, but, but actual cells and blood vessels that are still elastic and uh, Inside the cells are proteins that are still antigenic. We can tell what kind of proteins they are. And uh, they're even small fragments of DNA. 
uh, in, in these dinosaur bones. And you're like, the problem here is that kinetic chemistry and ambient temperatures, even freezing temperatures, but in, in like room temperatures like this, molecules vibrate. And as they vibrate over time, they break down. And at ambient temperatures like this, proteins cannot survive longer than 100,000 years. And even at freezing temperatures, they can't survive longer than a million years or so. And you're like, well, how in the world did these things survive? And uh, given the, the standard paradigm, and uh, it just doesn't make sense. Also, if you, those are cells, dinosaur cells. Also, uh, there are significant amounts of radiocarbon in these soft tissues as well. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. It's not detectable beyond about 80,000 years. And so the levels of carbon-14 in these dinosaur soft tissues is a similar level to that found in the Siberian mammoths and things like that. So you're like, wow, how does that kind of level get into dinosaur bones of radiocarbon? You can talk to more about Paul about that one. Uh, there's also tests of God. A lot of people say that the Bible's not scientific at all. The, the writers of the Bible had no concept of scientific thinking. But that's not true. There are scientific tests mentioned in the Bible. Um, for example, in Malachi 3.10 it says, test me about tithes and offerings and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. That's a potentially falsifiable test. You can try it out personally and see if this is not true in your own life. You can put God to the test. And he says, go ahead, try me on this one. And put me to the test and see if this doesn't happen and make a difference in your life. Uh, this is a scientific, potentially falsifiable test. Another scientific test mentioned in the Bible is an interesting one where the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and they took it to Philistia, put it in their temple with Dagon. Dagon kept falling over every night and breaking up more and more and more. And so then they removed the Ark and put it around in different cities and people started getting sick. A uh, bunch of different sicknesses going on, boils and stuff. And so they're like, well, we should get rid of this ark. Let's send it back to Israel. And they're like, well, let's send it back with a test to see if it was like random chance. And that, the word chance is actually used in 1 Samuel 6, 7 through 9. They use the word chance. So what they did is they took, to avoid random chance, to make sure this wasn't something random that happened to them, they took cows that just had calves, and they said, we were going to attach the cart to these cows, and if the cows go by themselves back to Israel, we'll know that God has done this to us. And if they stay with the calves, which is natural for them to do, we know that this happened to us by chance. Again, scientific test, potentially falsifiable. Same thing, Elijah calling fire down from heaven, waits all day long, everybody else gets exhausted, and he says a one sentence prayer, it's a test between Baal and God to see who will send fire down from heaven. It's described as a scientific test. Now, you may believe or not believe that it happened, but it's described in a scientific manner as a test, a potentially falsifiable test. And uh, Psalms as well. David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. You can, you can try to live according to the, what the Bible requires or asks of you and see if that doesn't make a difference in your life. It's kind of like for me in vanilla ice cream. I like vanilla ice cream. I've tasted it, and I like it. It's a kind of a, an internally derived test. And no one else can challenge you as, on your own experience with God. Uh, you can test God for yourself, and then you say, I te I've tested it, I've tasted it, I've tried it, I like it. Right? And Richard Dawkins came up, can't come up to you at that point and say, no, you don't. Right? Because, hey, it's my own test. <laughs> so you can try it out for yourself. And um, here's some other personal examples just from my own life. Um, we were walking in Lashton National Park a few weeks back, and uh, my boy Wesley, he was walking along uh, all over the place, path, no path, everywhere, crossing streams and all kinds of things. It's a, uh, about a five-mile hike to a waterfall. And uh, about a, uh, an hour into this, he runs up to me and says, I lost my pocket knife, the, the same one that was in my hand. I lost my pocket knife. And it was late in the day. It was getting toward dusk. And I was like, well, we're never going to find it. We would go down to the, the falls and make it to the falls. And on our way back, we're starting to get close to the cars, and it's getting dark. And um, my wife, Sigrid, she wasn't on a trail. We were just walking through the grass uh, close to some trees. And she, she says, you know, I think we should pray about this just because it would be kind of cool. And so she closes her eyes and says a prayer, and she says, Dear God, 
you know, if you could find this knife for us, that'd be kind of cool because, you know, Wesley hasn't seen anything like this before. And it'd be just kind of a cool thing. But, you know, I'm not going to be able to find it. So what you're going to have to do is put the knife in front of me when I open my eyes. And so she, when she said amen, she opened her eyes, and there was a knife on the ground in front of her. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, Wesley also had some other miracles happen to him. He was diagnosed with Crohn's when he was five years old, three years ago, Crohn's disease. And um, he was very sick. He had lost half of his hemoglobin. It took us about a year to figure out what was going wrong with him. And a bunch of strange things happened to him. And uh, for a five-year-old to have Crohn's is a little bit unlikely, uh, uh, not as common as an older child. And um, when he... Uh, Find out, finally found out that it really was Crohn's disease. Took him down and a, had a colonoscopy. It looked like hamburger, ulcers everywhere, bleeding. Uh, he had extremely high enzymes. Platelets were over a million. Uh, very sick. He couldn't even walk like 100 feet without taking a break uh, and resting up. And so we had him anointed. We had the pastor and the elders come over to our church, and we had him anointed. And um, he wasn't healed. Uh, at that particular point, but immediately thereafter, like that, um, the next Monday when I went back to work, one, you know, when somebody is diagnosed like this in your family, everybody comes out of the woodwork and tells you all kinds of harebrained ideas about what to do, and they're they're kind of a lot of them are just like, oh my goodness, you know, yeah, but uh, a friend of mine, a dermatologist, came to me and he told me one of these harebrained ideas, and he says, you know. I've uh, treated some of my patients who have autoimmune skin disorders like epidermolysis bullosa with uh, vitamin D, and they've gotten better. And uh, he says, you should probably look into it for your son, Wesley. I was like, okay, whatever. Yes, sure enough. And so I just blew him off. And the, but I, it stuck in my mind because he's a dermatologist. And so I decided to at least look it up and see if there was anything on Crohn's disease and vitamin D. And just like three months prior, there had been a couple papers published on Crohn's disease and vitamin D. And it turns out that it was protective. And also, um, there were some other papers I, I suddenly came across about um, treating with a liquid-only diet, Pediasure diet for 12 weeks, and that had uh, as good an effect as steroids on Crohn's disease and uh, better than biologics. But nobody knew why. Nobody knew why it worked. It's just ob observationally it worked. And so we started doing these things for Wesley, and gradually um, he got, oh, well, first I took it to his, his uh, specialist, a pediatric Crohn specialist, who's probably one of the best in the world. And he says, it's not going to work. You need to come and get biologics. But the problem with biologics that are immune suppressant medications um, is that they have a risk of 1 in 40,000 of untreatable lymphoma that will kill you in a year. And I personally diagnosed this three times in my practice. So I was like, if I have to, I have to, but there's no way I want to do that just because if there's any other option that doesn't have these side effects. So he says, well, it's not going to work. You'll be back in a couple of weeks, and we'll go from there. And so we started him on these things, and he started getting better. And uh, 12 weeks later, we went down and did another colonoscopy and another biopsy. He was perfectly clean. The biopsy itself was clean, and all his enzymes were normalized, and his platelets were coming down toward normal. And um, it's been three years now, and he has had no relapses uh, since then. We still give him some Pediasure every day, because, just because no one knows why. And j just this uh, last few months, it's been published that fasting for three days straight will reset the immune system in, in over half of people. And uh, get them over, or at least significantly improve their autoimmune condition. And I think that's somewhat related to the liquid diet. I don't know for sure uh, that that's worked. But it seemed to me like a better miracle, the way it worked out, because now that specialist is treating other children in the same manner, and they're doing better. They're doing well. And uh, so if God had healed Wesley immediately when he was anointed, that would not have been as good. So at some point, you have to leave things in God's hands and leave the miracle with him. But it's still a miracle that these things worked out the way they did, as far as I can tell. Because how was I able to find these things that were not standard care by any shot and that they just worked all of a sudden for Wesley? And that they're starting to work for other children. To me, that's a miracle that's better than an instant miracle. Um, 
There's also prophecy, which is amazing. I could get into that, but we don't have time today. But Peter calls it the more sure word of prophecy, saying that I, saw, I was there, I saw, I touched, I saw the divine, I saw Jesus raised from the grave, I saw all that stuff. But prophecy is better than that. And it is. If you look into it, it's amazing. It's something that we have today that's even better than what Peter had in his day uh, because we have more information on it. Just in closing, uh, touching on metamorphosis is really cool because you got this happy little caterpillar that crawls along, it gets happy and satisfied and fat and everything, and it's doing fine. It's happy with its life. And then all of a sudden something starts to go wrong inside of it. It's got these imaginal cells that start to grow. And it doesn't like this, what's going on inside of itself, and it mounts an immune response to destroy these imaginal cells. And uh, it fights against them, but they win the battle. And they take over the caterpillar, and they force the caterpillar to go and make a cocoon uh, or a chrysalis. And inside that cocoon or chrysalis, it, those imaginal cells liquefy the caterpillar. They completely destroy it, uh, destroy all of its parts and turn it into liquid goo. And then they use that stuff to make a new creature that's entirely different, a brand new creature that's entirely different. And how, it's very hard to explain that. With, uh, it's like embryology. How do you explain these steps where there's no na natural selection involved, uh, even theoretically? And so here's the tip of the caterpillar, the spinneret. It spins. Uh, it has to spin a little pad, a silk pad, for it to hang itself from. And it hangs itself by these little crochet hooks on the silk pad. Otherwise, if those hooks weren't there just right, it would fall to the ground and die. And all these, th all these parts are, have to be set up just right uh, for that thing to live. And uh, how to explain all that with a natural mechanism, it's a miracle, at least from that perspective. From Rod's perspective, of course, it's no, no big deal. It's just like making a cake. Uh, also, this blue butterfly is not blue. Uh, the blue color is, is based on chitin, which is a, a sugar. Uh, a molecule, and it has no color. And uh, so what happens is that they form structures called gyroids that are mathematically precise. And depending on the structure of the gyroid, you get different colors. Depending on the precise structure of different kinds of gyroids, you get different iridescent colors. But these gyroids have to be set up just right or you don't get any color at all. You can't do it slowly. Either you have the proper gyroid or you don't. And uh, so you can't just gradually evolve something like this, even theoretically, uh, because there's so, so much precision involved with getting it just right, the mathematical precision. So in summary, um, we're kind of like worms. Uh, hate to break it to you. And God, God actually thinks of us this way. He, he talked to uh, Jacob. He said, don't be afraid, O worm Jacob. Right? And Jacob's like, what, me, worm? Right? And he says, yeah, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord. You're a redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, because I like worms, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something with you, right? Make something out of this. And, and David said the same thing. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And God said, okay, well, I'll do it. I'll answer your, your prayer request here, and I'll give you a new heart. And this is an amazing thing because Ellen White talks about this as the greatest miracle. She says, the conversion of the human soul is of no little consequence. It is the greatest miracle performed by divine power. Greater than the universe, greater than living things, greater than anything we talked about today. You can ask for forgiveness today, ask for a new heart, just like David. And this is one prayer where God says yes every time, right? He doesn't say, wait a while, maybe in the future, if you, get, if you do something better, right? No, he says, right now, I'll give you a new heart right now. If you really want one, you ask sincerely for, for a new, new one, you're going to get one right now. And uh, it's the greatest miracle you can experience in your own life better than anything else that's ever been done. And because it cost God everything to give it to you, he had to, he had to sacrifice himself to be able to offer you this gift, this new creation, this new miracle. And uh, so... Just in closing, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, completely gone, and the new is gone. So, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know which light switch is. Yeah. So that uh, person that said, yeah, you're right, I 
would uh, reject God because I don't like to be judged by him. I, I would have, um, so, so that description of God, I would say, was a false picture of God. And so right. he's rightfully rejecting a false picture of God. So I would, for some of these guys, I think for some it does come down to, no, I don't want to be told by anybody anything. And I don't like the idea that there's anybody smarter than me. <laughs> but for some, I would, I would say that it is a sincere desire and, and they are trying to make sense and they're correctly rejecting a false picture of God. And so I think we should be a little charitable towards that uh, when we yeah. see that come up. I think the, the doctrine of eternal burning hell has driven more people away from from the idea of accepting God than anything so, else. So extreme people. Christianity, Christians need to take some responsibility for the falling in the ditch on the other side to get away from the kind of thinking that some Christians bring to this stuff. Yeah, because uh, for us as Christians here, at least my view of God, is that the judgment is a good or a bad thing. The judgment is a good thing because it says the judgment is given in favor of the saints. And what does it take to be a saint? Right? I mean, David was no saint, but it says that he's a friend of God, right? And God's going to give him a new heart. And so, I like David Asher, the way he described it. He says, a saint is someone who falls down seven times but keeps getting back up. Right? And the, the one who's lost is the one who doesn't get back up. The one who just stays down and says, I'm not going to ask for God's help anymore. And so, if, if you're on God's side, it doesn't matter how broken you are because God is going to make judgment in favor of you and going to fix you and make you into a new creature. And that's not up to you. It's nothing you can do even any more than the caterpillar can do. You can just say, I'm a wormy person and I admit it, right? And so then God says, well, I'm going to give judgment in favor of you and make something good out of this. And uh, so then you don't have to fear judgment because it's all up to God. So thanks for doing the footwork and studying and synthesizing this for us. I appreciate your thoughts today. Thank you. Can you pass the mic over? Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, during my career as a uh, really a neurobiologist uh, teaching in the Adventist system, I had the joy for about a decade of discussing these ideas with senior biology majors and uh, talking about a lot of what you presented. Uh, there is one particular quote that I think is really germane and perhaps a little revealing, and that is Richard Dawkins, uh, and we talked a lot about him. Actually, in one of his books, when he looks at the mechanism for the genetic replication, you know, the sort of thing you talked about, he basically says there's no way the original living organism could have had this system. It has far too many parts that have to exist, coexist. And so he says, okay, but after all, we're here. So therefore, this is what probably happens. And he d then proposes a completely theoretical mineral system to accomplish the same thing. Right. And he admits that the evidence that he has isn't it yeah, yeah. isn't interpretable within guys, the typical they'll, they'll evolutionary that, paradigm. They, they'll admit that they don't have the evidence, but they believe so strongly that it's turtles all the way down that they'll say, well, someday we'll come up with it. Well, I think, uh, it, I think this, uh, you've come to the point of the difference between uh, philosophical and methodological naturalism, frankly. There, there's a subtle difference, but I think they kind of... No, 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 I understand that. Yeah. But I'm saying we have reason to not go from methodological naturalism to philosophical naturalism. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think there's very good reason. I th actually, I think methodological naturalism leads you to the divine if you do it properly. If you allow it. Yeah. So unpack that nuance. What's that? Unpack that nuance. Well, methodological naturalism basically says you can only use natural uh, explanations in your scientific research. Philosophical natural, and God can exist and all that stuff. Philosophical naturalism says, well, it's pointless because everything that we've done methodologically leads us to more naturalistic explanations and not to the divine. Yeah. So therefore, why even pretend that Santa Claus exists or anything like this or flying teacups or flying spaghetti monsters? You might as well just admit that there, there's no fairies in the garden and no God in heaven and just say that it's all natural. I also had the joy of working with a number of uh, graduate students in an Adventist system and Frankly, there's no way to 
bring a, let me rephrase it slightly. We design experiments in the same way methodological naturalism proposes they should be done. Right. It's about the only way you can do it. Right, I agree with that part. But to uh, take the step beyond is frankly, I believe, just because there's a huge problem in looking beyond what's right in front well, of you. Well, here's, here's an illustration I like to show for this methodological naturalism. You set up an experiment with red and blue marbles in a box, like a thousand of them. And you divide them in half, red on this side, blue on this side. And then you shake up the box and, and you, you're doing an analysis to say how long it gets a random um, morphology. Red mixed with blue and, and the, st the statistics on that. And so let's say you shake it for about an hour and you leave to go to the bathroom, you come back in and you open the lid of the box and they're perfectly separated, red and blue. You're like, okay, where's my lab assistant, right? Somebody has tampered with this experiment. So you can detect using scientific natural, what you assume to be naturalistic processes and you can detect some design interference with that theoretically. Now does that always happen or does that mostly happen? No, almost never, otherwise you wouldn't describe it as a miracle. But when it does happen, science is able to detect it when it does, when and if it does. But for those of us on this side, it's very easy to propose artificial divides that convince us, but really don't have as much credibility as they should. Right, and, and I think a lot of that is because of the philosophy of naturalism. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, thank you guys very much. I always enjoy being no, here. We have one oh, more one comment. more. <laughs> yeah, just just one question. Um, you, you showed the fossils and the dinosaur eggs, and that kind of why if if uh, Dr. Baumgartner and his work on plate tectonics and his models for for the flood, how to generate a you know a kilometer layer of sediments in a short period of time, why is there any residual fossils at all? If, yeah, if he's sure. correct, I'm not. I, I'm a little bit familiar with Baumgartner. I, I don't exactly agree with all his mechanisms for how it's done. Um, but I don't exactly understand your question. How, how well, do sediments collect Well, it's just that if, if what he showed was the, in order for the flood to, to account for the thick layer of the sediments that we find um, that, are so, that we associate with the flood, um, it was a very violent process. So violent that, that you know, dinosaur nests would be disrupted completely, not just stressed. Well, and I'll tell you my view on it. I don't think it was violent everywhere, uh, at all times, at all points in time. I think the flood was very complex. I think it rose and fell and it swooped. Uh, there's evidence that entire continents were covered over and, re and the water receded multiple times. Entire continents. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And as it recedes, there's times where things get calm and that raindrops can happen on, on sedimentary layers and that the dinosaurs that survive can walk around. In fact, there's an interesting paper published by Leonard Brand again where the, uh, the footprints uh, exist in lower layers in the body fossils of the dinosaurs. So it seems like they survived for a while and made around their footprints walking all around and then they eventually succumbed to the repeated uh, flash floods that just flowed in like tsunamis fl flood in and then they receded and the dinosaurs walked around again. And some areas were extremely violent, and I think some areas gradually rose and gradually fell. And the, uh, the things shifted around as, as uh, asteroids hit the planet, let's say, in different spots. Huge tsunamis in, in local areas would destroy everything. But then as they proceeded around the globe in a circle, and as they met on the other side, they would lose a lot of energy. And they'd bounce back and forth, boom, 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 different ways. And so the, the flood, I believe, is very complex and not uniform in all places around the globe at all times. By the way, the uh, phenomenon of footprints preceding the animals is a common one. It happens with the tetrapods, where the tetrapod footprints are there before the tetrapods are there. The birds, bird footprints are there before the birds uh, appear. Yeah, animals, at least smart animals, are, are tenacious for life. And they'll, they'll try to survive any way they can, as long as they can. And they did, evidently, for quite a while uh, before they finally succumbed. I, for personally, I draw the, the uh, waning of the flood at the Cretaceous, where things started to settle down and then the chalk layers were formed. Because 
it was very warm, all those volcanoes and everything going off and asteroids hitting and all that. It got to be very hot, you know, warm water and, and algal blooms just took off with all the nutrients hitting the oceans and made these giant chalk layers all around the entire globe. So yeah, I think it's a very complex process and not the same all over the world at the same time. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Number one, um, when we are restored, final restoration, we're going to be made. We're going to be different. Yeah. We shall change with you as your character. I guess. Right. So uh, when the Lord married, thankfully, um, <laughs> thankfully, yes. <laughs> but when He created us, He created this man and woman, Adam and Eve, and not Adam and Steve. But. Um, well, now we're moving on, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. Um, when we go through this, when you consider, say, 37 trillion cells in our body, um, there's anabolism, catabolism going on. So there is life and death in there. When the Lord cursed Adam and Eve, things changed. What changed? Uh, and we're going to be different when we are made new. Some people think we're going to be so different that we're not really going to be physical at all because they can't understand a physical world that doesn't have some kind of death. Like when you eat an apple, the cells die, and that, or at least resorbed, and it doesn't exist anymore, whatever you want to call it. And microbes and stuff like that, how do you explain stepping on bugs? And, and um, so I don't, I don't go that far. I well, think, I, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, no, or it's coming. Right. Right, I think we're going to be physical beings. And the way I get around eating apples and things like that is that I believe in some living things are not sentient that they are bio-machines, and I would describe them as machines. And that nobody gets all disturbed when any apple gets eaten because it's not a living, it's not a living thing in a sentient sense. It is a machine that is created to benefit us and to support us in our senti sentient nature. Now, people would get upset if you beat a dog to death, right, because that's a sentient machine. But no one gets upset if I get a sledgehammer and just whack an apple to bits, right? <laughs> And the same thing with Bunsen burner. If I take a billion bacteria and go, no one gets upset. Why not? Because it's viewed that those are not sentient beings. Those are, those are machines. They're complex machines, and, you, and they're, you can argue that they're alive, and I would say that they are, but they're not the same alive as we are, or that, that sentient animals are either. Well, the life is in the germ. It's not in the endosperm. Well, it depends what kind of life. Like a sperm, no one gets upset. If I get a sperm out and I whack it to right. death either. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, but I'm talking about the apple. The the yeah. life is really in the in the sperm, in the sperm, yeah, not in the endosperm. But it's a it's different level. It's a layer. different level of life. So I think right. that that will exist in heaven as well, and in the new world, that there'll be different levels, and some things we won't get upset about because we view them as machines. Well, you know, going back to my question is, what really changed when the Lord cursed? Adam I don't and think Eve? anything changed. I think God, God was just. This, uh, stating in words a new reality. But he it says, now that you have, have deliberately separated yourself from the source of life, which is me, right? you're going to decay because of a natural process of the turtles going downhill. And, and that's just a natural state of things. When you separate yourself from the mechanic, your car is going to naturally decay. If you, as a human, separate yourself from the mechanic, your body is like a machine. It's going to decay. And that's, God is just stating a new reality. No, okay. Number two, um, talking about Crohn's disease, you think uh, autoimmune disease, you think cow's milk protein has anything to do with this all kinds of autoimmune diseases that we're seeing? There's ideas that it's caused by viruses or, or uh, prions or all kinds of things out there. And there's not really good evidence yet at this point. I'm not saying there's not a viral vector, something that somebody there's certainly a genetic sensitivity to some things and some people versus other. There's a genetic, certainly a genetic thing. Absolutely. But no one knows exactly what triggers it to set some people off and not other people. That hasn't been really well defined and no one really understands that part of it. Um, there's an imbalance of viruses that's very interesting and in people with Crohn's disease versus normal people. Uh, viruses are, can be very helpful <laughs> how, the, how they work in, inside your intestinal system. Resetting uh, the microbia inside your gut can be very helpful, inflammatory bowel, and also an uh, irritable bowel as well, all kinds of things. That's why fasting has been, has been shown, or at least theorized maybe to reset things. Like the immune system will die off 
because of the fast, and then the stem cells will regenerate a brand new immune system with, without as much sensitivity. And uh, anyway, there, there's a lot of new stuff coming on board, and I'm not sure exactly what will end up panning out and what won't. Is that total fasting, just drink water, nothing you, else? That's the ideal, is just drink water, but you can drink fruit juices and stuff if you get lightheaded and your sugar drops too low. Hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, guys. Been fun. Thank you very much.